We are now turning to the Word. So if you have your Bible, go ahead and open up. We are going again, of course, to John chapter 2. And I just want to say thank you for Michael and those who led last week. Really greatly appreciate uh, what God is doing among us here and bringing so many gifts to us. So thank you for that wherever he is. He is somewhere. So thank you for, for preaching and leading. And uh, by the way, Gretchen and I were at a conference uh, by Converge. Converge is a group that we are connected with that have ministries and churches all throughout the world. And so there's about 10 couples or so who gather together for an intensive to think about our ministry now, our relationship now personally and together with a focus on the future. And so we took lots of notes. We did a lot of praying, a lot of time talking and have some um, takeaways for the future. And so it was a great time to connect together with her, spend some time together, and of course, grateful to be back together here this morning. Okay, so the Apostle John continues to build his case, okay? He is building towards his purpose that all people would recognize that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that through him all may have life in his name. The theme verse for John is found in chapter 20, verse 31, and I'm going to have us repeat this uh, a number of weeks so we can have it memorized. If you go to the next slide, here it is, John 20, 31, and let's just say this together. So here we go. These are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. And so that is the whole point of the Gospel of John. And John gives us example after example, testimony after testimony, pointing to the identity of Jesus, building his case of this thesis that he indeed is the long-awaited Christ, and that by believing in him, we may have life in his name. He brings in the first chapter this glorious panorama of the greatness of Christ. John chapter 1 is astounding, and I hope that you have spent and will spend time looking through it, meditating on it, thinking about the concepts of Jesus, the light and what he has done, and Jesus, the lamb and what he has done. We see John the apostle bring forward testimony of the John the Baptist, who calls Jesus, of course, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John the Baptist then identifies Jesus as the Son of God. And Jesus then starts calling men to follow him. And when he calls them, he changes their identities changes in some cases their names who they are and what he sees for them in the future and when people see this and when we come to him indeed he changes us as well these first followers of christ then identified jesus as the messiah the son of god and so john continues to bring this evidence together and continues to put these stories and teachings together. This morning we're going to cover all of John chapter 2 and it's a lot and you can say well how are these stories related and I'm telling you the stories are related because John again is bringing this first miracle that we'll see in Cana and we'll see then Jesus clearing the temple and then we'll hear about what he says about himself and what he says about humanity. All of the things in this chapter are establishing Jesus's authority and so my four points this morning are these that Jesus has authority over creation. We'll see that Jesus has authority over the house of God. We'll see that Jesus has authority over death itself and that Jesus has authority over 
humankind. So this is the trajectory that John is declaring in this. So again, that we who are hearing, we who are reading, we hopefully who are understanding would understand and identify who Jesus is and what he's about. And so my hope for us is that if you're a believer, that your faith would be strengthened, that your heart would be encouraged, that your mind would be informed, that you will declare because of what is written who Jesus is, that your faith will be encouraged and informed. And those of us who are perhaps on the edge or who are a little bit on the outside still investigating, I want you to consider what he did, what was said about him, what he said about himself as you continue to investigate who is this one named Jesus. So that is the goal and the aim that at the end of this that your faith may be built upon the solid foundation of Jesus, who again is the Christ, that you will trust him greater, you will love him greater, you will worship him greater because he is greater than and over all things, okay? So that's the aim this morning. So here we are, John chapter 2, and we're going to just work through this section by section, starting with verse 1. It says this, on the third day, and if you're reading along, there's three days, John is just going chronologically, John the Apostle, says, on the third day, there was a wedding at Cana in Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus was, also was invited to the wedding with his disciples. Now, when the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. And Jesus said to her, woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you, right? That's an interesting start, right? We see this interplay of Jesus and his mom. It's put in historical context. And obviously Mary knew some things about Jesus not everybody knew about, right? She knew personally and intimately that this indeed was the Son of God. And so this is kind of an interesting interchange as they're talking and Jesus says, it's not my time, but Mary knew, you know, hey, just do whatever he tells you because I know he's going to do something, right? So here they are. It's an awkward and embarrassing situation for the host. So what happens next? Verse 6. Now there were six stone water jars there for the Jewish rites of purification. This was Old Testament. These were large pitchers of water that they were to uh, wash their hands in before they ate. They each hold 20 or 30 gallons. Now Jesus said to the servants... Fill the jars with water. And they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the feast. So they took it. Now when the master of the feast tasted the water, now become wine, uh, and did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the master of the feast called the bridegroom and said to him, dude, Everyone serves the good wine first, right? Where people can taste it a little clearer. <laughs> and then people, and when people have drunk freely, then they pour out the poor wine. But you have kept the good wine until now. This, verse 11, the first of his signs, and you'll see this in this chapter and other places, John is giving signs that point to the identity of Jesus. This miracle, the first of his signs, Jesus did in Cana in Galilee and manifested or made known, showed a foretaste of his glory. And his disciples believed in him. So what we see in this passage is this, that Jesus has authority over creation. Okay, So this miracle 
was taking one thing and making it into something completely different. Okay? This was not like a um, piece of marble and an artist comes and sees this rugged piece of rock and takes a chisel and through time makes it into a sculpture. Okay? Taking one thing and manipulating it but it's still marble. It's not that type of situation. He took water, and we're talking gallons and gallons and gallons of water, not just a little thimble, not just a cup, even though that would be amazing, right? Gallons filled to the brim of water. And because he has authority over all things created, he changed it from one substance into a completely different substance. Now, I have never made wine, even though I have drank wine, which I really don't like it, by the way. I know it's a process, right? It takes time. It takes intentionality. It takes growing grapes and, and certain flavors and then mashing it down and getting the juice and then fermenting it or whatever happens and careful care and all of this yahoo and stuff to make it happen, right? Jesus, with just a word, could change one thing to another thing. So the question is, well, why is that a sign, okay? Well, the good Jewish boys and girls learned their Old Testament. In the Old Testament, there are numbers of things recorded where God himself changed one thing into another thing. Many instances of this. For instance, he changed dust into a human being. He took a piece of wood and turned it into a snake, and then the snake changed back into a piece of wood. Thank you, Moses, as he threw down the staff before Pharaoh. He can turn water in the Nile into blood. He can turn dirt into gnats. He can turn dew into manna. Now, the Jewish people knew their history and knew that only God could transform one thing into something completely different. And now we see Jesus doing the same thing. That to them was a sign pointing to by what he did, not just by what he spoke, but what he actually did pointed to his true identity. This miracle was more than saving the embarrassment of the, of the host. It was a sign declaring that the one who could change one thing into something else was indeed the one who had authority over all creation. And by the way, this was a foretaste of many other miracles in which we see Jesus multiplying or changing or stilling creation. And so those who understood this, and John brings it to our ascension and say, listen, this man did this miracle unbeknownst to the taster of the wine who verified this was a true change. This was the best wine. And by the way, this is a foretaste of the great and glorious wedding feast that you all are invited to if you're in Christ as the bride. Right? The best, by the way, he saves for the end, right? We just get a little foretaste now, but the best is yet to come. So Jesus, the Christ, has a authority over creation. And when the servants realized what was going on, and when the disciples realized this, they believed his identity. 
Now John brings us to a, another a situation. Okay, so we saw him at this great wedding where this miracle took place, showing his authority over creation. And now he moves to another situation. This is John chapter 2, starting with verse 12. After this, he went down to Capernaum with his mother and his brothers and his disciples, verifying who was there, verifying who was, uh, was a part of this. And they stayed there for a few days. The Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple, this was the place of worship for the Jewish nation, they found those there who were selling oxen and sheep and pigeons and the money changers sitting there, right? And Jesus, making a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen. And he poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. And he told those who sold the pigeons, take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of trade. The disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. So what's the connection? Well, again, showing authority, pointing to the identity of who Jesus is. This event shows us that Jesus has authority over the house of God. Jesus cleansed the house because he owned the house, right? He didn't need anyone's permission to do what he was doing. He didn't walk up to the, the door and say, hey, I see all this riffraff here. They're taking advantage of the people. Hey, guys, don't you think that it would be good not to have them there? And you guys should probably do something about that, right? Let's have a conference and let's talk about it in a committee and let's figure this out and let's try to get things worked out, right? Yeah, none of that stuff. He walked around. He saw what was going on. And as the owner of the house, the focal point, being part of the trinity of worship. He didn't need anybody's permission, right? He said, mm, I ain't having none of this, y'all, right? Started to drive them out. Get out of here. Get out of here. This is not the purpose and intent of this place. We know that Jesus said that the house of God should be a house of prayer for all the nations. And those who were stewards, who were overseeing this house, had perverted it into something other than God attended. By the way, Jesus has authority over the church. And we can say, come on, pastor, right? He has the right to do with it as he wants to do with it. He is the head of the body, which is the church, and we are a part of it. God can do in his place of worship, in his house of prayer, what he decides he wants to do. And we have a responsibility, we have a right, we have a place, but we are all under his authority. And so when Jesus walked into the temple, right, and he did this and made the Pharisees, the religious leaders, leaders angry, because they thought that they had the right to this place. And who was this young upstart? Who does he think he is? Who does he think he knows what he's doing? And they were ticked. Jesus could do what he did. You know why? He had authority over the house of God. He didn't need their permission to do what he wanted to do. And by the way, he doesn't need your or my permission to do what he wants to do. John records this at this place in the story, pointing to the authority of this one named Christ. Because indeed, the zeal for the house of God will consume him and he is still zealous for his people, which is we, the church. By the way, do you know 
that now the Holy Spirit lives in our hearts and that we are the church. We are now the temple. Scripture talks about Jesus being the cornerstone, being the foundation in which God builds his church. And as we gather together, God's Spirit inhabits this place. And this not the place that's most important. It's the people of the Spirit. Right? We don't need a building to have church. Right? But we need the people and the presence of God to have church. John is pointing in these passages the identity of this person do not miss that jesus is the focal point of all scripture jesus is the capstone and the cornerstone of his church jesus is the glorious groom he is the king of kings he is the lamb of god and your faith put in christ is built upon facts built upon testimony built upon actual events and teaching of this one the christ jesus has authority over the house of god Let's now continue to read as these church leaders, these religious leaders, now interact with Jesus. So the Jews said to him, when they were recognizing or realizing that he embarrassed them and all these things he were doing, he, they said to him, oh, here's the word again, what sign, okay, circle that, what sign do you show us for doing these things? What authority do you have to do this? Jesus. Now, verse 19, Jesus answered them, destroy this temple, and in three days, I will raise it up. Now, there was confusion about that, because when Jesus said that, and he did it veiled at this point, they assumed he was talking about this grand, glorious building, but he wasn't talking about that Temple. He was talking about himself being the focal point of worship. And the Jew says, well, wait a second, Jesus. It had taken 46 years to build this temple. And will you raise it up in three days? Come on, man. But he was speaking about the temple of his body. Lots of theology there, but we'll leave some of that there. When therefore he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he said this. And they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. Jesus has authority over death. That's good news. You know why? The death rate hovers around 100%, right? If Jesus doesn't have authority over death, we all got problems, right? So Jesus was saying, hey, you know what authority I have? I'll show you the authority once I resurrect y'all. Because not only do I have authority over the house of God, but I have authority over death itself. My resurrection will prove what authority that I have. And at this point, it was veiled what he was going to do, but the disciples remembered, and as they looked through the Old Testament, they saw indeed that the Messiah would be giving his life for the ransom of the world, right? They understood, but they were veiled at this time. And if you need any evidence that Jesus is indeed the Son of God, we have to look no farther than the resurrection, right? No one has been resurrected before or after Jesus at the current point. 
Now you can say, well, wait a second, wait a second, wait a second. Wasn't there people who died and then came back to life? Yes. And guess what? They died again, right? Lazarus, was he resurrected? No, he was revived. Then he died. And there have been people who have come back, so to speak, from the dead. That's different than the resurrection. That's different than getting a new body of living forever and ever and ever and ever. He is the first to rise, to be resurrected from the dead. Overcoming death and Hades and hell itself because he has authority over them all. The hope of our resurrection does not rest in our good works, but rests in Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the Holy One who rose from the dead. Right? That's why we must believe in Him, because there's no one else like Him. All the religious leaders who have ever lived, all the Buddhas, all the prophets, all of the people out there, guess what? They're all dead. Not Jesus. Reigns forevermore. And by the way, he's coming back again. The whole world will behold his glory. Who is Jesus? What sign does he give? Well, he has authority over all creation. He can do what he wants with it. Jesus has authority over the house of God, the church of God, the people of God. He has authority over that. Jesus has authority over death itself. I have to ask you, do you know him? Do you know him? Yes, Jesus in the manger, but Jesus on the horse as well, right? This is the Son of God. And John, the evangelist, the apostle, perhaps the best friend of Jesus himself, are stitching these things together one after another after another so that we can know and believe and have life in his name. Jesus has authority over death. Now let's continue to read. Verse 23. Now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, many believed in his name. When they saw the signs, there's the word again, he was doing. And there's other things he was doing are not recorded, right? But Jesus, on his part, did not entrust himself to them because he knew all people. And he needed no one to bear witness about humanity, about men and women, for he himself knew what was in man. So Jesus has authority over humankind. Jesus knew a thing or two because he's seen a thing or two. Sounds familiar, right? He knows us. He knows us collectively as a species. Why? Because he created us. He knows us individually because he knows us. He knows what's in our heart. He knows what's in our mind. He knows us. Jesus has never come up to a person and asked their name. Who are you? He's never done that. Jesus doesn't need your name tag to know who you are. I probably do. He doesn't. So Jesus wasn't trying out to be God. (laughs) He knew every person. 
Jesus had authority over everyone because he knows everyone by name, even down to the very numbers of hairs on your head. There's no person that Jesus does not know. But the question is, do we know him? Right? At this point, he was saying, you know what? I am not showing these people at that point his full identity, even though he's giving sign. He was saying miraculous things, this amazing teaching. He was doing thing after thing after thing. But he knew that that wasn't the right time because he knew everybody saying that he has authority over everyone. Jesus has authority over humankind. Made us, walks with us, still knowing us, invites us to walk with him and will reveal himself fully and will ask us to give an account to him. That is the truth of the gospel. Regardless if you believe in him or not, that does not change his identity, right? He is indeed Lord, and Jesus indeed has authority over humankind. Now, as we continue to go through this gospel, and we're going to go for 16 weeks, we're going to go to about chapter 6 at the end of that Next week, we are jumping into one of the uh, most beloved and probably well-known chapters of all of Scripture, John chapter 3. We'll see Jesus interacting now with a religious leader, and we'll see him talking about the importance of being born again or born new, and we'll discover some of the things that he challenges and speaks to us. But before we get to this, understand John is setting us up, right? Setting us up as he is the light, he is the lamb, he is the life, he is the son of God, he is the Messiah. And as you read the book, you will see thing and thing and thing and thing and thing again. My hope is for you and for all of us, that we, the church, would treasure Jesus more than anything. Not just adding Jesus to your life. Well, I'm a Christian because I'm not Buddhist, right? Do you treasure Jesus more than anything? That is the line of demarcation between if you're a Christian or you're not a Christian. If you are a follower or a believer, are you hearing me today? Do you treasure him more than these? Right? That's the question. Who is Jesus? And most of you in this room would say, I believe he is impacted my heart. I believe in his life. I have given myself over to him and God help us to continue to glorify him see him praise him live for him follow him that's my hope that we would together um, honor worship hold to the highest regard Jesus who is the Christ, who has authority over creation, who has authority over the church, who has authority over death and has authority over our lives. Let us realize that. And again, if you're thinking, well, I'm not sure about who this is, then continue to read, continue to ask when I came to faith, that was the question I had to ask. Who is this Jesus, and why does his life matter, and how does he compare to everyone or everything or every other religion? And I'm telling you, there is no one like him. He is a revolutionary, but he's way more than that. The son of God, he's the door, he's the life, he's the shepherd, 
He is the King of kings. He is the Lord of lords. So God, here we are today, Lord, and we're considering these passages. God, we're so thankful that you have recorded for us the things that are true about Christ. We're grateful that you pronounced him, proclaimed him throughout all of history as we see in the Old Testament. And God, looking on this side as your spirit has been poured out and we have your word, God. We ask, Father, I ask God that we, your people, will treasure Christ for who he is. God, will you continue to show your goodness to us, your people? Will you continue to do miracles among us? Will you continue to, to, to change our hearts? Will you continue to lead us forward? Will you continue to help us to walk in your way? God, we're grateful that you called us to us. And God, I ask, Father, that we in our hearts would indeed proclaim that Jesus is Lord and gladly and joyfully give ourselves over in surrender to you. So God, you know, Lord, everything about us. We need your help. And God, we as your church and the church throughout the world say that you indeed are Lord. Fill us anew this day. Encourage our hearts again this day. Thank you that you indeed are the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world.